We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give. Oh, the shape that we were in. And just when all hope seemed lost, love opened the door for us. He said, "Come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and." Set free. Come to the table. Come meet this motley crew of misfits, these liars and these thieves. There's no one unwelcome here. How's everybody doing tonight, all right? It's good to see everybody. It is a blessing that we were able to come tonight so we didn't get stuck in some bad weather, as we all have to be mindful and thoughtful of each other. So we're really grateful for that, and we're grateful for the church. Amen? Thank you. One body, many parts. We have to look out for each other. Amen. All right, we're going to talk, we're going to do the Lord's Supper tonight. We're going to prepare our hearts to receive the communion and uh, commemorate the Lord's Last Supper and His death on the cross, our Savior for our sins. So let's talk a little bit of what this communion is about so we can really take in what we got to take in here. Excuse me, I got a little bit of a sniffles here and there, but Jesus got me here safely, amen? He's going to take us all safely home by the grace of God, amen? Thank God He's not holding our sins against us, right? And we'd be all done. Imagine if we had to perform after we got saved, we'd all be done. None of us can perform. Jesus did all the performing. If we could perform, we wouldn't need a Savior. And now we do. And thank you, Jesus. Now we're going to get to know that Savior. And that's what this church is all about. Becoming like Jesus. Dying to self. And becoming like Jesus. And letting Jesus live his life through us. Every good thing that comes in a believer's life after we get saved gives glory to God, not ourselves. Amen? So what's this communion about? Let's talk about this a little bit. This is the moment, okay, that took place at what we often refer to as the Last Supper, okay, where Jesus is sitting with his disciples and they're having a meal together. He interrupts the meal and he interrupts the conversation and he says, hey guys, I want you, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And this piece of bread is a representation of my body that's going to be broken for you. And every time you eat it, I want you to remember that. The same night he took the cup, remember, I took the breakdown of the Old Testament, that there was an old covenant, and that the New Testament is a representation of the new covenant that God has with man. And that is when Jesus holds up the cup and he says, this is the representation of the new covenant, that my blood will be shed for you. So we have to understand, some people want to do both covenants, and you can't, okay? There's only one covenant. It's the new covenant. In order for a new covenant to take hold, the old one has to pass on. Can I get an amen here? And sometimes Christianity tries to mix some of the Old Testament to the new, and we can't do that. You come out deformed, okay? The Old Testament is law. The New Testament is grace, mercy, and love. The law of love fulfills all the commandments. Can I get an amen here? Because we can't keep the commandments. The commandments were put into place to show us that we needed a Savior. So we have to understand that. So you, if you want to bring the old covenant back, you have to bring it all back. You can't just take the Sabbath out and the tithing out and the things you want to take out and leave the rest behind. You cannot do that. You have to what? Put away the old covenant and understand the new covenant. Can I get an amen here? Jesus didn't come to take away the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law. How do you fulfill a law? Well, love doesn't do any harm to anybody. When you love somebody, you don't talk about them. When you love someone, you don't murder them. When you love someone, you don't covet their goods or their wife or anything like that. When you love somebody, that fulfills the law. 
And that's what the unconditional love of God has. Jesus had unconditional love. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. If you look at that picture, it's a perfect representation up there on the wall of Jesus holding up the person who's going to put the nail in his hand. Now, can anybody do that in the flesh? Loving them and holding them up? The one that's about to kill you? Never. That's why we understand this new covenant. Without this new covenant, we're all doomed to a fiery grave. Can I get any men here? So I want us to really understand why we do communion here and what it means. It's not just some ritual. Now let me talk about this again. Communion, a sacred and symbolic event practiced by Christians worldwide, holds a profound significance rooted in the events of the Last Supper. Okay? At, the pivotal mo at that pivotal moment, Jesus, surrounded by his disciples, initiated a timeless tradition that transcends mere religious symbolism. The breaking of bread and sharing of the cup were not just physical acts, but profound expressions of sacrifice, covenant, and remembrance. The Last Supper, a divine interruption, is what it was. The narrative begins at the Last Supper, a historical event steeped in spiritual gravity. Jesus, in the midst of a shared meal with his disciples, disrupts the ordinary flow of conversation. His words, I want you to do this in remembrance of me, echo through the ages, inviting believers to partake in an event that would forever connect them to the sacrificial act that was to come. The bread the symbol of sacrifice. As Jesus takes a piece of bread, he imbues it with profound symbolism. This simple element becomes a representation of his body, destined to be broken for the salvation of humanity. The act of eating the bread becomes a sacred communion with the very essence of Christ's sacrifice. It is a tangible reminder of the selfishness, selflessness and love that underpin our Christian faith. Can I get an amen here? We're going to really understand why it's so important and why this church practices it every month. And we're never going to stop. Because without that, we, we wouldn't even be here. The cup, a new covenant sealed in the blood of Jesus. Now let's understand what the cup represents. Continuing the divine narrative, Jesus introduces the cup. Okay? Alluding to the Old Testament breakdown of the Old Covenant. Okay? In his hands, the cup transforms into a potent symbol of the new covenant that God establishes with humanity through the impending shedding of Jesus' blood. Each sip becomes a testament to the transformative power of this covenant, marking a transition from the old to the new from sin to redemption. Jesus is our redeemer. He redeemed us from our sins. No one is qualified to save us. We can't save ourselves. If we could save ourselves, if we could be goody two-shoes, we'd be able to not need Jesus because he's the one who saves us from what? Ourselves, our sins, our sin nature, the things, our selfishness, the things that we do without him. Now he puts his spirit inside of us, and now we start to do things that, were, that glorify God. And that's the process of sanctification that we take place in this church as we mature and understand that our old nature has to be done. The old nature is the old covenant. The new nature is the new covenant. Can I get an amen here? The old nature is the old covenant. Law etched in stones that we can't keep them. The new covenant is what? Jesus has shed blood for all. So that our sins may be forgiven and that we can be transformed into a new creation by the body and blood of Jesus Christ. He bore his blood, his body and blood flows through every believer. You have Jesus living inside you. It's a supernatural act that only can happen through what? Through God, an act of God. Is everybody with me so far? Okay. Communion as a living memory. A living memory. This is tangible. Communion is not a mere ritual. It is a living memory etched in our hearts as believers in Jesus Christ. How about an amen there? It serves as a spiritual anchor, connecting us 
to the foundational moments of our faith. Each time you or I partake the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup, we participate in a timeless act of remembrance. The event transcends the physical plane, inviting individuals to reflect on the profound implications of Christ's sacrifice for their life. Unity in communion. Beyond individual reflection, communion fosters a sense of unity amongst believers in Christ. As they collectively partake in the sacred elements, they become part of a larger spiritual community. The shared experience of communion transcends differences, emphasizing the common bond that unites all believers in the body of Christ. What, what unites us? Jesus. That's it. In our flesh, all of us have differences. Some people like different baseball teams. Some people like different restaurants. Some people like to go to different markets. When you try to force your opinion on someone else, you're now bringing the old covenant back. Instead of saying, hey, so whatever. We can agree to disagree. I love my brother because we all both believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And all of us are going to be in heaven someday, amen? And thank God that our flesh doesn't have to get in the way anymore. We come in unity of the Spirit. So when we take the cup and the, and the bread, we, that's a reminder that we come to church to worship in the Spirit, which is the new covenant. When you come to church in the flesh, you come to church in the law. You expect things of people. I can't believe they talk to me like that. Oh, they didn't shake my hand. I'm never going to talk to them again. They didn't call me back. Oh, this, that, and the other. We start to get what? Picky. And start to find indifference with people. But when we get together in the unity of the Spirit, we give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they were just busy. Maybe they didn't get it. Maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe their sin nature is getting the best of them today. Let's have some show some mercy and grace and love. How about a big amen there? And this reminds us is that's the core of the ministry. Accepting each other exactly where we're at. We're exactly where we're at. Every one of us is right where we have to be tonight. Don't expect somebody to be like you. Expect them to be like who? Jesus. We don't need clones. We don't need I don't need a clone, that's for sure. Nobody wants to clone me. Nobody wants to clone you either. Trust me. <laughs> we need Jesus to what? We need to let Jesus show out of us and less of ourselves. Remember John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. That's what he was trying to say. Jesus must show up more in my life and me has to show less. Because the Bible says, there's nothing good in me in my sin nature. In my new nature... It's all Jesus. It's all good. But he gets the glory. How about an amen for that? All right. When reflecting on the Last Supper through participation in communion, we can deepen our relationship with God and become more like Jesus. By regularly reflecting on Jesus' sacrifice and committing to following him, we can become more faithful and loving individuals who seek to serve others. Until that day, look back, look in, look up, look around, and look forward. Draw strength from your Savior as you partake of the bread and the cup. So the wedding invitation. Who's inviting to the wedding feast? Who is to receive the Lord's Supper? All who believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who died on the cross that they may be forgiven and reconciled to God, and rose from the dead. All right, let's pray for communion. Lord, as we take the bread, we remember that you are the bread of life. You feed our souls, you nourish our hearts, and you give us sustenance to run the race before us. As we break the bread, we feel the softness of your love for us. We smell the fragrance of the grace you release afresh each day. We thank you with all our hearts for the great price you paid when you were crucified on the cross for us. 
Yet just as the yeast has caused this bread to rise, you rose again, triumphant over death, as Lord of Lords and King of Kings forever. And our beloved Savior, Lord, as we drink this cup, we remember that you are the giver of life. You are forgiveness. You bring deep peace to our souls and your love flows within us. As we pour out this cup, we see your sacrifice poured out for us. We notice the depth of your goodness and the pain you suffered for us. We dwell upon the intricacy of human life and the price you paid to set us free. Yet just as the tombstone rolled away the unleashed the risen Lord, your light shines in our hearts now, extinguishing all darkness to release heaven's blessings upon us. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We take communion to remember the night which he was betrayed. He broke the bread, gave thanks. We remember the communion and the event that led to Jesus' crucifixion. Death and resurrection. At this time, I'm going to call the ushers to come up to pass off the elements, please. If you want to follow along with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you, or which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of the Lord's broken body, let us eat the bread together. Not too bad, right? A little salt. <laughs> All right. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Right? Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. In remembrance of the Lord's death on the cross and his shed blood for us, let us drink the cup together. And it goes pretty good together, huh? All right. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we praise you for this heavenly banquet that you have so freely given us, Lord. Thank you that we carry in our hearts the riches of this eternal goodness. May we pour it out wherever we go, lighting up the darkness with truth, 
speaking out hope where there's despair, and weaving your unconditional love into all we do. Send us now in the power and strength of the Holy Spirit. May we live to be all that you have destined us to be. Dear Lord Jesus, thanks and praise to you. Again, you fed us at your holy table with your own body and blood. By your word and supper, may we be led from this world of sorrow into life eternal. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I want a round of applause for our Lord and Savior tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for doing for us what we could never, ever do for ourselves. And we always bring that to remembrance that we just took in everything that we're learning. We're taking in Jesus. That's what we're doing. That's what it represents. We're taking in his word. We're taking in his principles. We're taking in his life. And we're what? Putting our life away. Each day, a little bit of us dies, and a little bit more of the spirit lives, right? These bodies are dying, but our spirits are being renewed every day as we renew our minds through the word of God. Amen? That's an awesome thing. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about this, approaching the new year, okay? I'm just going to get an understanding. None of us are perfect. Oh, yeah, let's go to Psalms. I forgot about that. Psalms 34. Let's check it out. That's it. My wife's the, she's the one. The point. I get the cue. A happy wife is a happy life. Trust me. Mm-mm. You learn. You learn. Most of the time it's the hard way. But we learn. Guys are stubborn. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> we are. I'm not going to get into the other side of things right now. <laughs> Psalms chapter 34. Let us all go there. <laughs> Just imagine a world. This is what it's going to be like. Just a little reminder of what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. That 1 Corinthians 13 love is going to be in us always. There's not going to be no more sin nature to fight against. Just imagine that. Every day, joyful and pleasant, not have to worry about any death or anything to hurt us. Just imagine, that's heaven. Now, he wants us to have that now. We can have that now. See, the promised land is a state of mind. As we renew our, mind with the, we renew our minds with the word of God and we start to trust him more and more, we apply these principles in our life down here and we stay stable. So whatever's going on, God's in control. He goes out ahead of me. I don't have to defend myself. He's my advocate. He's my savior. I don't have to keep opening my mouth. I don't have to keep running people down to feel better about myself anymore. Jesus sees, God sees me as Jesus right now, so why would I have to look any better? How about a big amen there? It takes the bitterness out of our hearts and the jealousy and to see other people get harmed and malice and all these things. And he puts him, his heart inside of us. Love, joy, peace, patience, tolerance, self-control. Just imagine everything that came out of your mouth was joyful and helpful and positive. No running people down, no gossiping about people. It's just a beautiful world. How about an amen to that? Well, I mean, if Christians actually learned the Bible and studied it, they could have a lot of that now. Unfortunately, people are not willing to give up, sacrifice their life and their time to do that. But that doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. You can get spanked all the way in. Like I said, just, let me just give you a little analogy. You got two people flying to Florida in a plane. Okay? They're all going to go there. The guy on the left doesn't trust the pilot. He's looking out the window. The turbulence comes. He's holding onto his seat like this. He's all scared all the way in. He's like, I'm never flying again. This is crazy. The guy on the right trusts the pilot. He's sitting there reading a book taking a nap, having something good to eat, something to drink, they both get to Florida safely. Who had, the, who had a nice trip? The guy who trusted the pilot. If you want to have a nice trip down here, you have to trust the pilot, Jesus Christ. Get the, I'm bringing it to reality here. Believing and trusting is two different things. I'll give you another analogy. 
I'm going to give you another analogy. This is, I'm going to bring this to earth right now for us, okay? You've got a guy on a high wire going across Niagara Falls in a wheelbarrow. He's going back and forth, back and forth. You see him and do it, and you believe that he can do it because you see him doing it, right? Now, if you trust him, get in it. Are you going to get in it? See, belief and trust are two different things. You see it, you believe it, but do you trust it enough to get in it? It's the same thing. You can believe in Jesus all you want, but to trust him with your life is a whole different thing. Can I get an amen here? See, it's two different things. I'm not getting in that wheelbarrow, that's for sure. Unless Jesus is the one in running it. If Jesus is running that wheelbarrow, I'll jump in in the New York second. But if any human being is going to try to push me across there in a high wire, no thank you. Sinners cannot fix sinners. Only the Savior can fix us. If we trust him in our lives, we could have a great trip down here. If you realize the resurrection power we all have and actually applied it to our lives when we needed it, smooth sailing all the way home. Guess what that is? It's a choice. It's a choice. Do you already have it in you? Everything that you need to live a godly life, the Bible says you already have. Now all you have to do is believe it and trust it and do it and apply it. How about a big amen there? Did I make that analogy good enough you can understand? How many of us don't trust the pilot? How many worried today? How many had a bad day? How many fell into their emotions and didn't trust the pilot with their life today? And fell apart with anger or gossip or slander or depression? Not trusting that there's a reason for everything that God does in our lives. Depression. All these things are part of human nature. They're in our lives. All of us have that. There's a, a lot of times I don't want to get up and go to work. But that don't mean I'm not going to. I have a choice to go. Can I get an amen here? All right, Psalms 34. I think I explained that pretty good. Let's go to verse 15. Let's see what we got here. Okay. Oh, this even fits what I was just talking about. All right, let's go to verse 12. Here's a, here's a rhetorical question from the Bible right here. Does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Do we? Does anyone want to live a life that's long and prosperous? Well, guess what? The Bible has the answer, and it has the remedy. Let's see what it says. Then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. So you want to live a life that's long and prosperous? Keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. There's two things that have to happen. Now, turning away from evil is one thing, but to replace it with something good is another. You can't just say, I'm not going to do it, and not replace it with something good. It says, turn away from evil and then do good. Search for peace. Peace doesn't come naturally. You have to search for it, and then you have to work to maintain it. Because there's going to be people in your life. There's going to be places in your life that are going to try to steal the peace that Jesus died to give you. You can blame it on a lot of things, but you have to maintain your peace by trusting what the Bible says so you can keep the peace. Now look what it says. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who are evil. Oh. No, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do. See, what we think is right and what we think God, what God thinks is right is two different things. You have to understand that. That's why we have to learn to what? Be good. Nobody has to tell us how to be bad. Nobody taught you how to be bad. It's natural in you because you're born without the spirit of God in you. Right? Like I said, if I let the kids out of the room right now, you think they're going to come and worship Jesus? No, they're going to head for the electrical socket. Or they're going to do something crazy. They're going to tell them, no, don't do that. Why? 
Because they don't know how to do good. It has to be taught. We don't know how to do good either in God's eyes. That's why we have to be taught again. That's why the Bible is our owner's manual. If you want to write your own owner's manual, that's one thing. God will let you. But God's owner's manual and our owner's manual are two different things. And this is the owner's manual we read in this church. And if you really want to change, which all of us need to do, we have to what? Study it. Now look what it says. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. So if somebody's doing evil to you, do we revile back with evil? No. He says leave it in God's hands. Right? Pray for them. Pray for those who persecute you. Now, can we do that in the flesh? With the right motive? Yeah, maybe you might be able to say, I'm going to pray for you, that you got run over. I'm going to pray for you that somebody gets back at you someday. But when Jesus is hot, you pray for them for salvation so they don't have to hurt anybody else. How about an amen there? The motive is behind it. It's what the motive of the prayer is about. Now look what it says. The Lord, look at verse 17. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them for all their troubles. Now do you believe that? See it? The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. And he rescues them from all their troubles. Now God does it in his time in his way. When you're not getting it done in your time in your way, you start taking over. You say, well, I trusted you for a couple hours, Lord, but you didn't come through, so I had to interrupt. One thing we lack is patience with Lord, the Lord. Nothing good comes easy or, or, or cheap. He rescues them from all this trouble. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. See it? How many of us? See, we have to understand how God is. We have broken hearts. All of us are broken hearted. He doesn't come to a prideful heart. He comes to a broken heart. It says the Lord is close to broken hearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. See it? Look what it says. The righteous person faces many troubles. See? We're all going to face troubles, it says in the Bible. See? We're not taught that. Some churches don't teach that. It says the righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. Do you believe that? You have to trust it. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. See, because if you don't trust and obey, you end up becoming a miserable Christian. I'll tell you what, I'm not miserable. Because you know what, I don't even deserve anything that the Lord gives me after salvation. Why should we, we just... There's something about human beings that always want more and more and more and more and can't just be content with what he gives us. And then he'll grow us up and we'll be able to get it someday. You realize a lot of times God's waiting to bless you because he knows that you, you can't handle it right now. If he blesses you with some prosperity that you'll walk away from him. So what does he have to do first? He has to get inside of us and change it. Change us. He changes the heart first. Then the blessings come later. But it takes time and maturity. He's going to bless us. you got another day of life, don't you? You're blessed. Look what it says. Look at verse 20. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous. Not one of them is broken. Remember on the cross? They hastened to death because it was the Passover. They were going to break Jesus' legs. To hasten his death, but he was already dead. Not That's to fulfill that process. Um, prophecy. Not one of them is broken. Jesus was the only righteous one on the planet. Now look what it says. Calamity will surely destroy the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. Now there's people out there right now that really hate Christians, that are doing the right thing. They really hate us. If we go out there and voice ourselves that we want to live a certain way and follow the Bible, they call us bad people. They call us all kinds of names because we want to live by the principles of the Bible. When we don't tell anybody else how to live, we just want to live lives worthy of God. And then when we try to do that, we get persecuted for doing the right thing. 
Look what happened to Jesus. What did, what, what did Jesus do that he deserved to die? Did he do anything wrong? He was bringing people back from the dead. He was helping the poor. He was raising. The blind were seeing. The deaf were hearing. The lame were walking. They got so jealous they wanted to kill him. They're going to get jealous of you if you live a righteous life down here. Because you're showing them that there's light in this dark world. And there's a power that can give us that light. And that's Jesus. You see? So when you show that light, it what? It shines light on people's darkness. And that what? That's what makes them what? Ruffles their feathers up. You can mention a lot of names out there. But when you mention Jesus' name, you can mention Buddha, Muhammad, all devil, Satan, all these things. But when you mention Jesus, oh, don't come near me with that. I don't want to hear about Jesus. Why? Because that's the truth. That'll set them free. There's another force out there that puts blinders on people so they can't see the glory of God. And there's only one person that can open their eyes. Jesus. And we represent Jesus. So we, we to what? Help them to open their eyes by living a life like Jesus would live. Now look what it says. Calamity will surely destroy the wicked. And those who hate the righteous will be punished. But the Lord will redeem those who serve him. Do you see what it's saying? Not yourself. Serve him. The Lord will redeem those who serve him. From go from darkness to light. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. How about a big amen there? I trust it. Listen, I don't, it doesn't really matter what people think of me. It's all matters what Jesus thinks of me. You see, that's why I'm not afraid to talk about Jesus. Because he's the only one that can save me. People can't save me. Their advice can't save me. Their principles can't save me. Only Jesus can save me. So why would I not want to talk about Jesus, the one who's saving me? Because what? People start tripping about it. Oh, I can't let people know that I follow Jesus like that. They'll think I'm too churchy. Or I'm a Jesus freak. You don't have to be a freak to live like Jesus. You can just be like Jesus. Accept people where they're at. Love them unconditionally. Be kind to people, even ones that are not kind to you. That's how you show Jesus. How about a big amen there? All right, I love you guys. Isn't the Bible awesome? I don't know about you, but before, I wasn't learning about the Bible and how to live right. I was just going to hear... Kneel, stand, sit, this, that, and the other thing. And I wasn't learning, I wasn't getting, knowing a relationship with Jesus. Now we're learning to have a relationship with Jesus and understand the principles of the Bible. If you can't understand them, you can't apply them. If you don't know what they are. So I'm helping you to understand the principles so you can apply them. That's how we grow spiritually. How about a big amen there? And sometimes the messages are a little bit hard. But what did God do to his people? that were living sinful lives. He put them in exile for 70 years because he loved them. That's how far their hearts turned from him and were worshiping the world and idols. He put them in exile for 70 years. Does that mean Jesus, did God didn't like them? He loved them. But that's what it took to break them enough to get them back. Sometimes he has to bring us through some pain and suffering to get us back home. Because we're stubborn. Can I get an amen here? All right. Let's go to this little couple of principles. I have a couple of ways to approach the new year, all right? For many, New Year's is just another holiday. For others, it's a time of deep reflection, right? Both on the past year and on the one ahead. For followers of Jesus, New Year has no unique significance, right? There is no central biblical narrative informing our celebrations. But this doesn't mean Christians shouldn't pause and reflect on the turning of the calendar. Okay? Moses asked the Lord, teach us to number our days so we may get a heart of wisdom. Psalm 90, verse 12. Time, seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years is a gift to us from a good God. To wisely follow him, then, is to redeem our time. Ephesians 5, verse 16. New Year's can also remind us of the new birth, 
Right? In a sense, each day with Jesus is a chance to turn the page of an old way of life and embrace a new one. We are, after all, new creation people. And we serve a king who renews us daily by the Holy Spirit. Setting goals for a new year are an important sign that we're intentional about glorifying God in our callings. See, our intentions are good. We do want to make good godly changes in our lives so we can be drawn close, closer to Jesus, right? So look, we're intentional about glorifying God in our callings, work and business, home and church, private and public witness. When we work and plan, even seemingly in insignificant endeavors, we're fulfilling the cultural mandate, Genesis 128. Right? In this age, we're blessed with an abundance of resources to help us to maximize our time, digital tools, productivity experts, and inspirational teachings. But before we write our goals, we should begin, listen now, in the heart. The first goal should be in the heart. The temptation for Christians is to make our plans and add a dollop of Jesus on top rather than allowing him to form us in us the desires and motivations to do his work. Because God is working in you, giving you the desire in the power to do what pleases him. Remember we read that last week? Remember I said read Philippians? Did anybody read the book of Philippians? That book. If you read, I'm telling you, read the book of Philippians. You will, you will be blessed with an understanding of Jesus to the T. Read it though. You know what? Before you read though, always pray. Say, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. So I could hear you. So that I could see that you're speaking to me here, Lord. You have to pray this because our flesh, you could read the Bible as a book or you could read the Bible as a spirit. And when you ask the Lord to speak to your heart, he will. And he'll get deep inside of you, not other people, you. And start to change you. He plants a seed inside of you. And that seed starts to grow as you water it with the word of God. All right. The temptation for Christians to make our plans and add a dollop, desires and motivation to do his work. So whether or not we're making concrete goals, listen to me now, or more abstract ones, whether we're written down, writing down or foregoing them all together, here are a few important steps we can take as we peer into 2024 to draw, to draw closer to Christ. Let's go. The first one is to remember. Remember. Always remember where you were and where you are today. Go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. There's another good book to read. You want wisdom. Understand God's ways. Ecclesiastes. Go to chapter 12. The Lord wants us to remember him before anything else in our lives. The first glance when you wake up in the morning is remembering Jesus. That's putting him first. Look at verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Don't let the excitement of you, oh, you, I'm sorry. Did I say you again? I can't get that. All right. Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. Remember him before the light of the sun, moon, and stars is dim in your old eyes and rain clouds continually darken your sky. Remember him before your legs, the gods of your house, start to tremble, and before your shoulders, the strong men stoop. Remember him before your teeth, your few remaining servants, 
Stop grinding and before your eyes, the woman looking through the windows, see dimly. Remember him before the door to life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. Now you rise at the first chirping of the birds, but then all their sounds will grow faint. Remember him before you become fearful of falling and worry about danger in the streets. Before your hair turns white like an almond. Wait a minute. I don't have any hair. It would be white if the few that would come out. There'd be, there would be some gray in there. <laughs> All right. See what he's trying to get at here? How to remember him first. Let him remember him first. Look what it says here. Look. Before your hair turns white like an almond tree in bloom and you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper and the caper berry no longer inspires sexual desire. Remember him before you near the grave, your everlasting home, when the mourners will weep at your funeral. Yes, remember your creator now while you're young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well, for then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Concluding thoughts about the teacher. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. Keep this in mind. The teacher was considered wise, and he taught the people everything he knew. He listened carefully to many proverbs, studying and classifying them. The teacher sought to find just the right words to express truth clearly. So, now listen to this now. Hear me on this now. This, listen to what this says. The words of the wise are like cattle prods. Painful but helpful. Listen, the words of the wise are like, you know what a cattle prod is, right? Does anybody know what a cattle prod is? It's like a little thing with electricity in it. And they prod the cattle, give them a shock. It's painful. It makes them go back if, they're going, if they go astray. So he's saying that the words of the wise are like a cattle prod. They're painful, but helpful. Can I get an amen here? See, when you're in the spirit, the words that crucify our flesh are painful. But they're helpful in teaching us spiritual things. Look at it. Their collected sayings are like a nail-studded stick with which a shepherd drives the sheep. He's saying... Good, wise, wisdom words are like a nail-studded stick. They, you know what it is? They prick our flesh. They make our flesh crawl because it tries to kill our flesh and make us grow spiritually. Can I get an amen here? So you know that somebody's teaching you truth, although it might be painful, it's to help you grow spiritually because the people teaching it love you. They're not going to tell you what you want to hear. They're going to tell you what you need to hear. Can I get an amen here? And that's, I'm, I'm up at this pulpit to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Can I get an amen? Thank you. That's what the Bible says. Now look what it says. Look at verse 12. But my child, let me give you some further advice. Be careful. For writing books is endless and too much study wears you out. That's the whole story. Now, here's my final conclusion. All right, this is the final conclusion that Solomon came up with for life. Listen to what it says. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. That's the concluding words of the smartest man on the planet. That was his final conclusion after he ran the gamut in his life. These were his final words. Fear God and obey him. So what's my good godly advice to you? Fear God, respect him, and obey him. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and why are we so disobedient? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is. 
We got such a weak flesh. We don't realize how weak our flesh is because when it comes calling to say no to it, it's so strong to say no to it. That's how powerful the flesh is. But we have a power now inside of us way stronger than our flesh. It's called the Holy Spirit. That if you listen to that voice, you'll be blessed. You got two voices to listen to, the flesh or the spirit. And right now, is the Spirit speaking to you? Fear God, right? God will judge everything we do, including every secret thing. So that's not me talking. This is God talking. So if you get mad at what I'm saying, it's because you're getting mad at what God's saying to you. Can I get an amen here? Because I love you. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. Straight up, right from the book. You just read Ecclesiastes with me, the whole book. Some of you might not have read that book your whole entire life. This church, in just 10 minutes, read the whole book to you. That's how much of the word of God we, we bank on in our church. Amen? For what? Your benefit. So you can grow spiritually and say bye-bye to you. Bye-bye to your flesh. Bye-bye. You wake up in the morning. All right, Jesus, use me. Because I'm useless without you. How about a big amen here? Thank you for letting me share that. Thank you. We had a great day. Come to the table